I'm about to meet, well, if you're a vegan, he's a hero, but if you are on our side of the argument, he is a horror of the animal rights movement. And we're using football in no man's land rules here. We're suspending hostilities. I am going to let him say what he wants to say so that you can hear it. I'm not going to jump down his throat every time he says something offensive. That's the, uh, the, the rules we've, we've come up with. Maybe, who knows, I doubt it, we could find some consensus. He is the press officer for the Animal Liberation Front. He is the face of the Stop the Badger Cull movement. He's Jay Tiernan. So we're standing in front of a pheasant pen. Uh -huh. uh, ground rules for today, you very kindly agreed not to tear it down on camera. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you would anyway. Would I wouldn't, you? no. no. Okay. That's not me. Right. Pheasants uh, have become a target for uh, ALF recently, yeah. and uh, and you your your online is the press officer of the yeah. ALF. Yeah. And that, that is that self-identifying, or is there a sort of top-down structure in the ALF where you kind of been appointed, or have you agreed that? Uh, so I spoke to people within the Animal Liberation Front support group, which has been there and continued for quite some time, and there hasn't been a press officer for quite a, for quite a while. Uh, and so I spoke to them, uh, and I saw that there, with the rise of veganism. Uh, in the last few years, that so there is a potential for a huge rise in direct action other than hunt, sabot hunt sabotage and the badger cull, which has seen its own in you know, increases in direct action in the countryside. So when you see something like I don't know, a badger cage being jumped up and down on, that's happened quite a lot and it's criminal damage, but yeah, okay, so I've spoken out in favour of it, but not as the Animal Liberation Front Press Officer, so that's kind of been an extension of it, it but it's been in and anticipation that things may start becoming. And so last year in Devon or Cornwall, I think it's Southern Partridges, I want to say. Mm. Um, um, and I helped with the story, getting it into the Times. And I felt when I was doing that, I, I was referred to as an animal welfare campaigner. Um, but animal I welfare campaigner? I think, I think that's what happened. Right. No, I think that's how the, the uh, Times listed me. And it, it, and it did make me think, if someone wanted to be in a position like you or the BBC wanted to talk to someone and say, what are the people's motivations? Why are they doing this? Um, there isn't anyone to explain it. And I felt that it was it was becoming more and more necessary. You're sort of a bit arm's length though, aren't you? About, uh, you know, you, you're not gonna claim responsibility for that. Uh, you're, you're more like Sinn Féin to the IRA rather than... I'm not saying that I'm taking part in it myself. No. But um, I wouldn't feel particularly, I mean, there's some things that if I said, even if that I supported it, it wouldn't do, it would be difficult for me if later on I was arrested for a conspiracy charges or inciting stuff. It'd be difficult for me to do it. I have to be in a kind of position where I explain what people's motivations are and why they're doing it rather yeah, than whether so or not I support it. I mean, to clear that one up, you, you have gone on record to say, you know, it doesn't matter what you say in the court as long as you get off. I mean, basically, yeah. you, you, you are keen to play the system in that, in that yeah. way. Can of I course. just ask about the, so we're talking about stamping on cages, which is a stop the cull activity. Yeah. Talking about uh, cutting the wire around game farms, which is an ALF. Um, and then you've got the, uh, uh, the hunt saboteurs, which is black balaclavas going out of the weekend and, and sabbing hunts. Mm. Is there a great deal of crossover between those three things, or do you see them as very distinct? Are the people the same? Um, I think with regards, n no, I think there is crossover, but I think that what's happened with the Badger Cull is it's brought in a lot of people who um, f are concerned that with fox hunting, the, the, the friction that you have with the other side is almost guaranteed and that they don't want that friction. They're potentially concerned that uh, they'll be attacked or they're concerned that they may become violent. So you see quite frequently people saying, I, I can't do that, I, I would. People on your side? Yeah. Okay. So they can't, they feel that they can't do uh, hunt sabotage for a number of reasons. Some people get over that and go on to do hunt sabotage and, and aren't involved in uh, worrying about someone attacking them um, because the, the attacks by huntsmen on uh, hunt saboteurs do happen quite frequently across the country, but not on one group every week. And we've just seen a court case where a master has been convicted. I mean, you, there is an argument that if you are a hunt saboteur and you go out to confront lots of people who are riding hot on horses, you are going to get knocked occasionally. And similarly, we've seen hunt saboteurs beating up hunt staff, haven't we? Um, I don't think it's been quite a while since anyone's 
been seen to be attacking hunt stuff, but uh, I don't think there should be an expectation on either side of violence. But what I'm saying is that well, there's an expectation of confrontation, isn't there? Which yes. has kind of got violence slightly written. Possibly, into it. yes. Okay. Uh, go, go, go back to 1906. So, you, you, sorry, you want to finish that point? Go okay, finish that point. Uh, yeah. So with regards to the uh, crossover, I think that well, there are definitely people out there involved in the badger cult. I think there's possibly more people involved in the badger cold because we have a number of people who just walk on footpaths and don't crush cages but they might find the cage and then tell someone else uh, you've, but, got, you've got the kind of the wildlife trust movement uh, who will who will do the footpath walking in the daytime and yeah. you've got the kind of activists who will go out at night there's not no i wouldn't say it was day and night like a bit like that there's plenty of activists who, who can only do uh, daytime there's plenty of activists there's plenty of people who walk uh, if they've got full-time jobs they're walking the footpaths at night time so i wouldn't do the night and day split but there are certainly two different distinct groups, one group remaining very lawful and the other group happy to trespass and happy to jump up and down on cages. Now, with regards to jumping up and down on cages, that's criminal damage. You see that all the way through the badger court. You see it day after day after day after day after day. You do not see that in uh, fox hunting. You don't see people damaging each other's vehicles every single time there's a, a hunt going out. No, you, you, you do see, uh, you know, occasionally groups of saboteurs who've got a bit lost and find a pheasant pen like this and, and pull it down. I mean, that happens. Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen that. Um, but, I mean, badger cull, certainly, it's, it's your kind of out of badger cull season activity. Is, it seems to be, yeah. there's more anti-pheasant shooting stuff going on when yeah. the badger cull is not <coughs> on. Yeah. So it there seems to be a great deal of crossover from... So the then of. crossover from uh, the Badger Cull and the Hunt Saboteurs, I wouldn't be able to say which group have crossed over into uh, releasing uh, game birds or if it's the same people, but I would, I would guess it's, it's people from both. Right, well, that's the nuts and bolts of it. Um, as a vegan, I'm, I'm not trying to trap you here, but I, just, no. I genuinely want to know you the answer. When, you, when somebody releases a whole lot of pheasants out mm -hmm. of a game farm yeah they're not going to find trees to sleep in the middle of the night they're going to get nailed by foxes isn't that yeah bad for the birds um i think that uh, as a vegan personally my view is that it's about damage limitation and i think that that's probably the same thing that's going on with uh, game farm releases so when we see um a singular game a pheasant hen we would expect that to produce maybe 28 eggs-ish throughout the whole season and 20 birds to come from those 28 eggs. And so one single pheasant represents 20 pheasants going into the industry. And so if you have had to pre-order your chicks in December or November for the following year from a game farmer and come that time of year they're not there because they've all been released but it potentially means that a number of shoots are going to go out of business uh, yes they may find somewhere else at the last minute they may find they may see that as soon as the release has happened thought oh my god i've got an ordering with him i better go elsewhere that may well have happened but when you look through um, comments online by game farmers themselves there clearly is some years not enough pheasants to go around and if there isn't enough pheasants some years to go around then doing large releases from game farms and reducing that number of pheasants means that in turn, let's say here, they couldn't release pheasants. What then happens here this year? It means that there's no shooting, which means that there also isn't any predator control either. I'm still getting a sense of uh, means justifying ends here when you're, when you're talking about the, the fate of the individual pheasants. I think, yeah, and I think, that in, I think in part because the pheasant, um, because they're seen as being, I think if you did it with uh, chickens from a boiler shed, they might actually suffer a very similar fate with regards to the amount of time. But I think pheasants are seen as being semi-wild. Um, and that's clearly what the, the idea is, that they're released into the countryside. And when, when we talk about pheasants, when people who talk about shooting pheasants, they frequently refer to them. And there's a, I think there's an idea which is perpetuated that pheasants are this kind of wild animal. I don't think if you asked nine out of ten people where do pheasants come from, they would just be like, oh, the countryside. They wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, game farms where they're intensively reared in in raised cages or in breeding pens, they would have no idea. And I think when you when you see the when you see the comments online about the released uh, birds from game farms, people are saying, "Well, it's better that than they get shot." It's like, well, actually, none of these birds were probably okay. Some X layers go to shoots, but none of these birds probably were actually going to be shot. They were all going to be in these cages until they died. And so I think then we have a question of, well, whenever we liberate animals, and potentially they only have hours of freedom or days of freedom. Is that better than them being kept where they are? Well, 
But if you're then saying, well, on top of that, all of their progeny, which is going to result in that if it was 9,000 birds, that's maybe 200,000 uh, fewer animals, for the, then it becomes, I think, on balance even more. And then when we say, when we see comments from people in the shooting industry online, they're saying, well, you've, you've, all those birds are going to die now. It's like, well, okay, let's have a look at what does the GWCT say about uh, pheasants and how many survive. And they have a little graph. Um, and I think it's something like a third of birds are shot. And on February the 1st, 16% are uh, still alive. So if on February the 1st, 16% are still alive, here we are now today, middle of July, when we came, if we come here during the shooting season, there are many thousands of birds. And now we have seen a few, and clearly some have survived, but we would not expect, I don't think either of us would expect to find hundreds and hundreds of birds have made it through. No, well, breeding population, of, I mean, the pheasants we know basically does not produce chicks unless you intensively um, you know, control the predators on mm. the ground. For example, unless you, unless you have a lot of gamekeepers on the ground, it's very, very difficult to produce a wild yeah. bird shoot. Sure. Um, and so this is this is why you have this. But so that so that means then all of the birds that you're putting out, yeah, yeah. well not all, but a very high percentage, by the time shooting starts the following year, have nearly all died. So they've not all of the but all of the birds, ninety five percent don't even reach one year old. Okay, well, I, want to, I just want to reassure the viewers, I have got an answer for that, but I, 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 want, to, I want to kind of extend this conversation okay. so, because I, I think we're going to kind of come to the, you know, that to me is a cul-de-sac and we'll reach that at the end of the conversation. Um, but as, as far as you're concerned, uh, pheasant shooting is bad. They, they don't, they're not a cornerstone species. They, they should not be considered to be the reason that this piece of country is managed like it is. And that, that, that doesn't bother you at all. Um, I, as much as it's nice to see um, people maybe putting strips of uh, to one side, why does it always have to be done for a financial gain? And obviously, often it isn't done for financial gain because not all pheasant shoots um, are, are are making uh, money. Um, uh, it isn't something I'd want to see, and I, and I don't th I don't think that uh, I don't think that any of the conservation arguments that I've come across. Are particularly strong, and I think that there is. Well, they're not strong compared to your vegan argument because that's that's. No, what no, I'm not, like. without comparing them, I think that uh, there there has to be questions over releasing so many pheasants into the environment. Well, there's a sense of pay to play here, isn't there? Because you know, un unless you have the pheasant, unless you have the pheasant shoots, you're not going to have the gamekeeper, and if you don't have the gamekeeper, you won't have the cover crops. You won't have these wonderful butterflies floating around here. You know, it will be wall to wall crop. In fact, you, I, I would argue that almost all the woodland you see from your railway carriage window is there for hunting or shooting and therefore it's a woodland trust just over there and it isn't well yeah but i mean <laughs> and just... farmers are given subsidies and as michael gove wants to do is put them there for public use so farmers will be given subsidies for the environment but, but the countryside is an evolution you know we have the reason we can see this woodland here is because over decades and maybe even hundreds of years it has it has been allowed to grow up because they have pheasant shooting it they didn't it would be like that. I don't think it's going to be how how long has pheasant shooting been going for? Is it hundreds of years? It's 150 years okay. old. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, in this kind of breech loading, mm. home bang, lots and lots of yeah. pheasants idea. Um, but that, but that has increased massively in the last just in the last few years. It, it's it's increased a lot. I mean, I, I think the the numbers of pheasants in the 1970s compared to now, you know, there's been, there's been an increase. But then as a result, there's been a terrific increase in. You know, managed woodland like that. We've stopped tearing up hedges because we know that they're good for pheasants. We've now put in beetle banks. We now have this kind of mm. this landscape, and we wouldn't have that without pheasant shooting. Is my problem? Well, I think that people tear not tearing up a hedgerow just because it's good for pheasants is is kind of appalling. It's like well, it's better if we tear up the hedges because it's easier for our tractors, but it, it's not particularly good for the soil, is it? And and, and, and people don't do things because it's. You know, it, but they're subsidised. They are subsidised. They are subsidised, but, but you know, the, the policing... OK, so what, this was my point. We're going to come on to your kind of ideal world at the end. So, okay. But that, that was that's kind of the direction of travel of our argument and the direction of travel yeah. of your argument is you should manage this. I would also be concerned about, I think... Um, yeah, so I've recently been reading um, a book called Shoot and Shooting, um, and it's written in 1951 about pheasant shooting. And he was talking about... The, uh, just the numbers. Yes, there were big shoots back then, certainly. But from other people I've spoken to recently, some people seem to be kind of, well, what, how I shoot with uh, a dozen of us, and uh, we over the whole day we shoot twenty pheasants. What impact does that have on the environment? And 
you would and, and, and you would still and you would still want these hedgerows and you'd still want these woodlands compared to putting down hundreds and hundreds of uh, thousands of birds in the same all right so i'm, I'm really i'm really interested you're, you're you're kind of going in on the big bags argument because one of the things that seems to me to characterize the anti-shooting anti-hunting movement is you are worried about the tragedy of a single bird dying mm. but you i mean most people i think are on your side that's what offends them but then if you start talking about a large number of birds you worry about big bags as well do you i think that there is what agency it has when we talk about uh, and certainly you know we've just recently seen earlier in the year the times kind of coming out as anti-shooting well not really anti-shooting no, because the exactly. times exactly the times isn't anti-shooting it certainly isn't but they are very much concerned about the waste and i think a lot of people uh, they're very much concerned about selling newspapers and they have discovered they may that, well be but they they, they th okay well let's, you found that the, the the footage of dumping pheasants yeah in Leicestershire that was your footage wasn't it? yeah but I work I didn't work by myself I worked with uh, two other groups I worked with the Hunt Saboteur Association and West Midlands Hunt Saboteur so it was a joint effort so it wasn't me finding it I worked with two other groups and we worked together it was me that filmed it though it was you the film is, I yeah. mean is there, is there a, are you worried is there a sort of aggravated trespass charge hanging over this whole no. thing no it's all that's all yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay so that. right let's 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 go with that one because the shooting industry condemned that mm -hmm. roundly except you uh, yes we didn't yeah. absolutely because we saw that the birds were by and large bested out yeah and therefore you know that the meat had been taken off them what what more what more do you want us to do we can't eat the feathers but you could eat the thighs and thighs are sold in all the supermarkets could eat the thighs, but, but you do eat the, th the thighs yeah, are we, sold in supermarkets we, 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 we could eat the thighs but then if you're talking about the the okay the, the public doesn't care about this kind of thing i i this is me being on the back, back foot at around about the same time um, JD Weatherspoon got the delivery date for 90,000 steaks. They got the wrong day. Mm -hmm. So they trashed effectively 10,000 head of cattle because yeah. they had to throw them all away. Yeah. People don't care about that. I think, yep, I, mean, I think that you're right that, that you know, the amount of food waste is appalling. So what we're looking at there was a food waste, but you were billing it as a kind of live bird waste. Um, I think that one of the issues is that we have the, like the large numbers of pheasants going in. It isn't the the problem with the large numbers of pheasants going in is that you obviously there's going to be a proportion of predator control that goes with that and there's also going to be the environmental impact of the birds themselves people talk about adders being uh, predated upon by pheasants so anything I think where you pour in and we're at this point now where none of us can actually accurately say how many pheasants are being put into the countryside a year you know the, the other day uh, I think the Patrick, Service says 40 million something like that and yet in 2013 there was a document from the AHVLA that said there was 50 million and that was six years ago wow. so uh, and then uh, but then since there it's less and I can't see that it's gone down since 2013 um, but whether we say 43 million or 60 million Lots. it's yeah. many many millions yeah. and I think that most people already don't have much of an idea of where those pheasants come from they're probably not particularly interested um, but when you start but in their minds, I think most people think that they're, they're wild birds. And so people going out and killing things, I think most people, because they eat meat, um, are of an opinion that if you kill something and then you eat it, it's like, well, that's kind of what people do, I think. I'm not saying that I advocate that, but I think that people kind of, but when you say, yeah, I killed it and then they just threw it in the, a bin, because well, I was just doing it, for, I was just doing it because I enjoy but they, shooting. But they were, but you, you were offering that, that kind of flagpole moment, where as far as most of the public is concerned, those were whole birds being dumped in a pit and buried and in fact they were mostly if not all we couldn't see most of them that they, they had been breasted They'd in which been case breasted. the meat had been taken off the thigh meat had not been the taken off so taken off, so I we can we can do a, we can do a percentage and you can tell me what percentage in weight the thigh meat is compared to the breast meat they could be 50 percent, 30 percent. i'm sure your viewers will probably know how much weight percentage it is and then we can say well actually 20 percent of all or 30 percent or 40 percent but nevertheless there is when lots shoot, of food being well, thrown yeah, away there is when i shoot pheasants i have absolutely no problem breasting them out and throwing the rest of the carcass away yeah that, that to me is fine but it's not fine for you but i wouldn't I wouldn't well, advocate it anyway because I'm vegan. Yeah, of course, of course. But, <laughs> but I think that the, the, the thing is that it res. I think mm, I think that also if I think that there are elements within the shooting community, the general public, and where animal rights people may be able to easily uh, attack the pheasant shooting industry with, and they're throwing the birds away, and they're throwing the dead bodies away. You know, I've, yeah, which are, and there, yeah, and, okay. and there are these big bag shoots. <laughs> Uh, where they're killing thousands of them, and okay, you've got... well, I think I think you're doing you're doing you're doing several things at once there. So you are obviously you're appealing to the animal rights community with the uh, the image of all those birds being thrown away. 
Uh, then... No, I think that's appealing to the general public. Well, no, but then you're also appealing to the general public, but you're appealing to them in a different way because you're saying, look at all these birds, isn't it terrible? Mm. Whereas the animal rights people are going, look at that one bird, isn't it terrible? And then you're also putting a, a bit of a lever under the shooting community itself because you know there is an internal argument about Big Bang yeah. at the moment. So you, so basically you get three for the price of one with that one. Yeah, and it's not just the dumping, there's multiple issues. So when we talk about lead, if we talk about lead and we say, oh, at the end of a shoot, uh, there's X number of kilos have gone been sprayed across this piece of land actually it would be on the other side of that woodland. Um, when we say X number of kilos, if it was, uh, if it's hundreds and hundreds of birds, if it's a high bag, then the number of kilos of lead sprayed out on the countryside is obviously much it's higher. Very, it's very large. But the and if it's a, a, only a small number of birds being shot at, then it's infinitesimally, infinitesimally small. And so again, if I had to argue the case to uh, politicians or to the general public, this is a bad thing. Yeah. yeah, it's the excesses of the industry <laughs> that, are the, that are the bad things. And if, and if those bad, th those excessive elements weren't there, yeah. it would be very difficult for me to argue the case for that single bird. I'm not saying I wouldn't, no. but I, I may go, well, actually, I'd uh, get more traction with the public talking about dairy cows. All right. If I may, I think the, there's, there's, no, there's no science that says that spraying lead across land is terribly bad for land. Yeah, there there's is. Lots, well, there's there's the Oxford of, Lead Symposium. There's lots, of, there's lots of science saying putting lead into water is very bad for waterfowl that ingest it and use it to grind up food. But no, you, there's you, also, you should, be, you there's should also, be, I cannot give you some money, you should be going on plastic wads. Plastic wads are the bad thing. You know, okay. that's the, if, I, if I may. Anyway. <laughs> but there's also stuff. birds that have been shot that aren't picked up, being eaten. Oh, not many. I mean, they're either cleaned up by foxes or they're picked up. I mean, the reason we have so many pickers up. It's, it, oh, yes, okay. There is a level of cruelty in, in everything that shooting does, but there's a level of cruelty in everything everybody does. I mean, I notice you're that very cleverly not wearing leather shoes today. I, but I'm sure vegan and have, have been since the then. 90s. But it's very difficult for you to have a footprint on this planet without, you know, the badgers who live in the home you live in were not rehomed by the council. I totally agree with that, which is why I think that veganism is a fairly easily attainable benchmark, but it does not put you in a position of we're now all OK. Right. I think there is still plenty of things to be talking about. And as I was saying to you before about, uh, I think, that, like chocolate, we could argue about chocolate for quite a long time. It's, it might be vegan, but if it's not fairly traded and it's, it's not organic, it's probably still doing some damage. We could say the same about cotton. I would say the same thing about salad, having seen photographs of south uh, eastern Spain from the air and a mm. huge sheet of plastic. And everyone eats salad. Yeah, Let's not try to make out that... No, no, no. the, the, the... It's not just a vegan thing, yeah. but, but I don't think you can be guilt-free about eating salad. I don't think you'll be you can't, guilt -free you can't be guilt-free about eating anything. It's a question of damage limitation. When we talk about um, what we're eating, when people say, oh, well, you're eating... Uh, something, whatever it is, it's a crop. Would well, you know what goes on with crops? It's like, well, yeah, I do know what goes on with crops and nearly 50% of the world's crops are fed to livestock. So if you took those livestock out of the equation, then you'd have all of those crops, but you wouldn't have all of those crops because you, there'd be no point in growing them all. I'm not saying we'd obviously have to grow some because we'd need some of the calories and protein intake, but we would not need that much. So we could literally feed the world. We, America alone, grows 100 million acres of soya. Can you imagine how many people that would feed? Yeah. If you... I, I, that, I mean, there are very good examples of excessive, but I do want to get to this at the end. Okay. I think this is about you know, wh where you see the English landscape. All right, just going back to pheasants, 40 million pheasants. I mean, one problem you have got is pheasant shooting is extremely popular. You know, somebody is paying to shoot those at upwards of 30 pounds per bird, and around about 40% of them are being shot. So. Uh, somebody do the maths for me, but that's quite a lot of hundreds of millions of pounds going in and being paid for by the 600,000 people in this country. It's a minority, but it's a big minority that have got shotgun licenses. Is there 600,000 people that have shotgun licenses? And of all those 600,000 people who have shotgun licenses, do they all go out pheasant shooting? I think I the really. Home Office says 480,000 of them. The okay. latest figure it put out are, are bird shooters. Okay. Some kind. So those 480,000 people who are enjoying the sport of pheasant shooting, why are the rest of us subsidising them with shotgun licence costs? There's probably an argument that driving licenses are in the same area, but the point is, it's about a, it's a level of regulation, isn't but, it? And shotgun owners have a level of citizenship and responsibility, which uh, it, perhaps that's worth paying for. They do. They can't. You know, you can do what you like. When, I can't, if I have a shotgun and I go out and I use that shotgun, I, every time I go out and use it, I'm not particularly paying into the uh, government. Whereas if I'm driving a car, I am. And I see, and I think a lot of people do, when you explain the differences in shotgun license costs, they see it as it goes back to David Cameron, who was keen on shooting, and uh, there was a look at the increase in the shotgun licenses, and he didn't do it. Is it? And he did that, and that, and that strikes 
a lot of people, when you put it like that, it strikes them as nepotism. Well, okay, we're, talking, we're talking about you know, the, the action of government on hunting and shooting. I, yeah. I, I argue it is, generally speaking, the Tories who bring in the rules that bash hunting, gun ownership. With the exception of Tony Blair and his Hunting Act, almost all the, you know, all the gun laws uh, were formulated during Tory governments uh, in the last 30 years. And uh, and actually, the Tory government. I mean, for example, the, the retraction of the general licences. You know, that's the kind of thing that uh, that, that we worry. Labour has generally speaking been quite good for hunting and shooting. So I don't. I, I think what happens basically is in government when it comes to it, we our argument works. So the grouse shooting debate in Westminster Hall. You know, we walk that one. In the kind of mass of judiciary, police, civil service, the kind of the, the second leg of the stool, uh, we work about most of the time. Where we completely fail on my side is in the TV studio, where you win. When you walk into a TV studio, you, know, you are a convicted criminal for what you have done, mm -hmm. and yet you are also a, a hero as far as the TV studio is concerned. I am an ex a living example of citizenship and responsibility because I've got a gun license and I'm the bad guy. Mm -hmm. that, that seems to me a little perverse. It doesn't seem perverse to me, but I don't uh, see myself, uh, certainly don't see myself as a hero. I certainly don't feel like that I'm treated as one by the BBC. They give me as much grief as, as anyone. Um, going back to uh, shotguns and shotgun licenses and the gaming industry and uh, legislation, there isn't any legislation that particularly covers the rearing of game birds. There is a game rearers code, which yes. the uh, British Game Association, uh, Alliance, sorry. Game the, the British, British, Game Alliance, British Game Alliance say that you must uh, follow these codes to. It's a sort of red tractor scheme, isn't it? Yes, well, but actually, it's just think, a nonsense. Well, no, I think I think you see that you've hit on something else, which I think is really important. It's, you know, I'm quite keen for people to educate me out of my unfashionable views. Mm. It's when people legislate me out of them that I I get cross. Okay. So I'm so, okay. keen for you to talk me out of it. Okay. Well, there must be some split within the uh, game farming community between raised cages and rearing pens. It's either a split or they're concerned that at some point rearing pens, race cages, sorry, are going to be made illegal and so they're not investing in them. Uh, I don't know why it would be that some people uh, are doing, that the way that I see it, that race cages and the factory farm conditions have come into England via France because it's the most economically viable way of doing the job. And, that I, and so then, when you look around at game farms, driven to quite a few of, why are there still rearing pens? And, I, and having looked at rearing, rearing pens, cages. rearing cage, no, rearing pens, pens yeah, yeah, breeding okay. pens. Yes. So those breeding pens quite often have all of the things that you would see in the game rearers' codes. They have uh, covers, they have little places for them to lay eggs. Good. You like that. I don't say that I like it, but if I compare it to uh, raised cages, I could argue against raised cages all day long. And I think that yeah. probably people within the shooting industry would say, yeah, raised cages aren't uh, particularly good. And even we've got the British Game Alliance saying, if you want to be part of the British Game Alliance, then you have to follow, okay? Yeah. In, the, in, in that code, it says- so good. You, We're heading in the right direction as far as you're concerned, aren't we? Well, no, because the, the, the number of cages, the, 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 the community, the British Game Alliance should be completely against raised cages. Oh. And yet you've got Bettis Hall, but with barren cages, but we, if, as a member, if we if we have if we have got a tendency towards what you consider to be better welfare, and I'm, I'm not, I I'm don't not, know if you have. I well, think you, we, you say you haven't. Okay, so but I, I think isn't that the aim of the BGA is to is to move us towards that and get shooters to say I'm only going to go to uh, BGA bad shoots because okay you you don't like certain aspects of what they do, but I think you're going to not like quite a lot of aspects of what they do, aren't they? Generally, uh, and that's why I, I'm coming back to there. The, the, it's the excesses where the, it's the excesses where I would get political traction, and it was excesses where I'd get traction with the uh, general public. It's the excesses, and I think that when you, when we say when people are saying oh well pheasants and they have a mind in their mind, they don't really think about them being factory farmed. Okay, yeah. they don't really think about them being factory farmed. They don't know how intensive pheasant rearing can be. They have no idea. Most of the year they're, they're, they, they have a, a lovely life. In Most of the year they're, they're not, well, we already know they're not alive, are they? They haven't made it past February the 1st. There's only 16% left according to the GWCT. Wow. And then that's February the 1st. How many are left on March the 1st are when all of the feeders and water have been turned off? That is the tragedy of the, you know, that's the tragedy of being a wild animal in this country. Is it? You're, you're not going to be, you know, you're not going to die in your bed surrounded by your grandchildren. No, <laughs> you're not, no. But to call them wild, I think, is a little bit... If they were wild, 
if they're wild animals, yeah. then uh, me coming along here and, and really opening these cages because they're wild and just letting them out, well, what's the issue? What's the issue with them being released from uh, game farms if they're wild? Well, they're not, they're wild, not but, wild. No, they're not wild in game farms, <laughs> no, but, but at the point at which you release them, then they become wild. But at the point at which you release them, which is uh, they're going into these cages in a couple of weeks' this time. Is, this is another pet cage. They won't be. Pen. pen, sorry, sorry. Not yeah, in, sorry. To keep foxes out. So. Okay. But when they go into there, yeah. they are kept there for, a, for, a, for another number they of. Stay there until they learn to fly. They can fly out. They can fly into this yep. game cover here. If a fox comes along, they can fly back in again and they're yeah, safe. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that sounds to me like a pretty good life. And then at what point are they kind of encouraged into here the whole time? They're, when the shooting season starts? No, they. they 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 blim in Rome. That's one of the problems. Oh, no. with the yeah, yeah. You know, they, uh, I, I know they you don't see don't them. I know far. you see them in there the whole time. But they are kind of uh, no, no, the like cages them. are opened yeah. up. Well, you've got feeders in there, but you also have feeders out here. They go to where the food is. But you see, you see the pens opened up. You literally see, mm. not by us. No, but by then, but by then they're roosting in trees. And, okay. and, when, and when is that? What point of the year is that? That we're talking when September. September okay, so we're talking September. Yeah. yeah. And by so at that point they start they're starting to be what you would say wild. Well, no, they were wild before that. They were just too young to okay. fly away from foxes. And so but they're, and, they're, and so they were in. And so they're inside here to keep the foxes pen, out. But, and they're wild in those pens. Yeah. It's 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 that it's that idea where you know madness exists outside the pen. You know, and li uh, life is within the pen. And so why? Uh, Okay, they're wild animals, yeah. and yet one of the main problems that the game industry has is predation. So they don't fit very well in into the ecology of it all. No, so we so we we knock knock the predators back. So you knock the predators back, yes. but we can't uh, escape the fact that thirty percent, thirty five percent are being predated upon. No, that's right. A lot a lot of them get hit by predators, but that and again is a tragedy. Being and then and then a percentage are being run over. Yes, terrible, but you know. Yeah, again, yeah, yeah. And they, and, they in, and they in turn are being eaten by scavengers. Yes, that's right. So the entire pred predator population that would eat pheasants yep. has been artificially increased. There's a recent article entirely about this point of how the number of predators... Now, I know that you're killing them, the we're, predators, we're, but... We're in an entirely artificial landscape. I mean, if, if you know, if, if we... I want this bit I want to get onto at the end, but if we, want, <laughs> if we want natural England to be natural England, then we just basically move to France and leave this to go back to southern English deciduous woodland, don't we? mixed woodland and that, that's what would happen over a hundred years if we walked away from this field. Yeah, it might be less than that if you go and have a look at Chernobyl. Yeah. It, well actually yes a lot less. I, I, went to, I, I went to a place in northern France which was uh, a, a, an open um, plain because they chopped down the trees for firewood mm. and uh, that was only 70 or 80 years ago and now it is a proper, proper yeah. piece of woodland so, yeah, yeah. so it, would, it would be very fast. Yeah. But the point is it, it, we don't live in that, we live in a kind of huge land mixed landscape where You've got somebody over there who doesn't like pheasant shooting, mm. um, but they let the hunt on their land and they preserve the foxes so the hunt can hunt them. And you've got mm. this lot who shoot the foxes and they get crossed with them. And Preserve the foxes. They, they, actually, they actually do not shoot the foxes so the hunt can go on their land. And in, in some places they feed foxes. And in some places they even feed various yeah. real loonies out there. Exactly. We're all, a bit, we're all a bit mad. And they're feeding foxes because they enjoy chasing them. No, are you talking about the hunts who feed the yeah, foxes? Yeah. Okay, I was, I was talking about the I was okay. talking about the, the antis who feed the foxes. But um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, one of the things that um, but we see that I mean, that isn't to me that isn't a surprise to see foxes being fed by terrier men. To me, isn't a surprise. It's like well, they enjoy chasing foxes. Yeah, yeah. Well, so of course, I'm so they're so they're, good, so they're yeah. feeding so they're feeding foxes. But everyone who sees it from the general public's point of view is like, I thought that was illegal. So this this kind of proves that they're not. Uh, no, but then the general public can get very muddled about these things because they don't come out here and, and take part in this in these kinds of sports. So they don't. They don't. Okay, listen. What about the hare survey uh, in Ireland? Queen's University, Belfast, discovered there are 80 times more hares in coursing areas than non-coursing areas in in Ireland. Mm. Now that's artificial, yeah. obviously. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think that I think that it was a similar thing. I don't know about this study, but I, kn I do know that. Uh, from I can remember back in the 90s before fox hunting was illegal that the fox populations were said to be higher in places where fox hunting was taking place yes. um, and I've met someone who was a kennel boy who had a uh, disused train that was full of foxes that they would feed as they did their rounds of uh, fallen stock and feeding them which still carries on to some degree um, and then um, and then I'm being asked do I think that that's okay because that means there's more of them? Yes. No, I don't. You don't? No. Okay. I think that they should, uh, I think that the whole 
creating artificially high levels of predators is going to have a knock-on effect. And so when we hear people from the shooting industry decrying the fact that uh, badgers are eating hedgehogs and there isn't any hedgehogs anymore because badgers are eating them, or there aren't any curlews left because the foxes have eaten them, or it's like, you're the very people who've increased the predator numbers yeah. massively, yeah, so massively. So you can't really complain about, you can't really use that as an argument, as a defence. We can't, we can't, we can't for them being legislated against, against uh, knocking over badgers, can't we? Because uh, if we, the principle we stick to is if you're managing your ground, you look at it, you know it, and you say to a greater or less extent, and you have the also received information from the outside, but the idea is you look at it and go, there are too many of that thing, there are none of that, not enough of that thing, mm -hmm. And there's just about the right amount of that thing. If there's too many, you do something about it. And if there's not enough, you do something to encourage them. I would say that you're always going to be, it's always going to be impossible to actually dictate and say accurately, even roughly, how large the wild population is of any predator. Exactly, it's totally subjective. I mean, so it's so subjective. that's why I would say that the, the fox population now is much higher, even in areas here, even with snares down, even with people actively shooting foxes. Because there's a lot more food. Because there's a lot more food. Yeah, so and so then to say, in the say, and then, then to say, oh, well, we've got to kill the foxes because of the curlews. It's like, well, that's not really true, is it? But if you really cared about curlews, if you were really genuinely caring about curlews, then don't breed well, okay. pheasants. So quick, quick you know, turn, to change your sport into, uh, take a camera out and enjoy that. Brood management for curlews, and you, you don't necessarily support that because that's been a. I don't think the RSPB particularly support brood management. They 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 go they tend towards a rewilding concept rather than a managed concept. Well, I've just seen this thing the other day with the hen harriers being moved into uh, a bird of prey centre, right. and that's being done apparently to protect the grouse. And that's just it's just insane. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I, I must say, if, if if it is exactly as you say, it does sound a bit dotty, doesn't it? I mean, uh, well, Natural England uh, okayed it some months ago. There you go. All right. Well, we we've, we've learnt not to approve of Natural England over recent months. <laughs> could we? Is there a chance we could move into the right hand side of that, or in, underneath yeah. a tree? I'm just yeah. starting to get boil a bit. Is yeah, that all right? Exactly. No, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. You. Uh, we've moved. We've moved position because it's it's hot. It's out, getting it? hot. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, badgers sensibly spend. Most of the day underground at this yep. time, especially same, this time same temperature all the time. Um, where, where did you where did you first come across badgers? Because you first got into this whole thing with uh, f uh, f f sabbing fox hunts, didn't you, back in the nineties? Yes, I did uh, sabbing fox uh, sabbing fox hunts in the nineties. Was how I started. So my very first thing was going to an anti hunt demonstration in uh, Boxing Day '96, which you know a number of people go to the boxing hunt. And then I met sabs, and I started going out sabbing. And then in, um, I want to say 99, but I think it might be 2000, RBCT started. I think it was 99, yeah. RBCT started. It might have even been 98. RBCT? A uh, uh, randomised badger culling C trial. Well done. Or okay. Also known as Krebs. Okay, yes, indeed. Um, so, quite uh, nearly all uh, saboteurs, but not all, but, but it wasn't anything like uh, now. I think that, the, uh, that those badger calls, which were instigated by the Labour Party, the Labour Party was in charge at that point, Just and the <laughs> Labour Party also went on to renege on a lot of its promises that it made before the 97 election. They, yes, they did ban fur farming, yes, they did... Uh, put laws in against fox hunting, um, but they didn't have a Royal Commission against vivisection, and they did bring in tougher laws against people campaigning against vivisection. I mean, they, they made fox so the hunting party... amazingly popular by, by restricting it, they didn't really ban it, yeah. and, and the restrictions they put in, as we've seen, just don't work, yeah. and now everybody wants to change them. But they did ban coursing, they did actually forbid coursing, so that, mm. I mean, that's one thing that you might argue was good. Yeah, I think the ban banning of fur farms was good. Okay. All right. I think that was really positive. But you had, you had a number of things you could have gone for there. I mean, at the, at the time there so were the Monsanto two, crops. I mean, there was a lot of animal yep. welfare rights area you could have. But you headed for badgers particularly. Uh, I, at that point in the late nineties, I didn't. I was just, I was that was just one of many campaigns that I did. So I wasn't uh, particularly a spokesman. I was just another person walking around out in the fields looking for cages. And uh, we used to have a, quite a different. The cages were much more robust. You couldn't. You could just about between three of you crush one, but you pretty much needed bolt cutters. So there was a whole cat and mouse act of taking bolt cutters uh, through the countryside, having to hide them in stashes, finding them, going back, rah, 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 which we don't really have. But... So it's like great rock bands. You prefer the early stuff. You know, that, that was better. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it was better because there was very few of us. Mm. Um, 
that you would have coals and there would be uh, five people maybe or ten people in some areas and whilst we do still have coals now um, where there are areas where there's very few people and especially now it's just rolled out and rolled out and rolled out there are still some coal zones that may have more than 100 people in them at a weekend. But you're talking about the kind of the wild, wildlife trust support group rather than the core. I would say across crushes. the board because okay. I say those because everyone is does is making a difference. Whereas during crabs, not or RBCT, we didn't have those people at all. No. In fact, I think it's the I think it was crabs coming out with this. It doesn't make enough difference. It isn't uh, worthwhile undertaking killing badgers that cemented that for a lot of people who probably were fence sitting who maybe shouldn't have been. So I think maybe badger groups certainly weren't coming out uh, in favour as much as they were. You know, when, when we had the badger camp badger in Somerset uh, in 2013, we would have people openly from badger groups from across the country coming to visit us, maybe take part, maybe give us donations. Um, that was a little bit more like a kind of like a, a, a um, like an anti-nuclear camp, wasn't it? That was somewhere you could go and express mm. your your anti-badger cull feelings. Did they then go out and crush cages at night? Uh, those people, w the people who were from the Badger Trust uh, group, certainly didn't because they were uh, would have all have been uh, the, much more on the patrol side. But they certainly would have gone out into the night. There were meetings every evening at uh, seven or eight p.m. in the car park, and you'd get fifty to one hundred people turning up for those and, and, go, and those, that was just the lawful side of it and then we'd have uh, the coal zone split up into uh, five or six different areas and then different hunt sab groups would be taking on those areas in uh, alongside other people who were just turning up and so they'd, they'd come to you have people coming to the camp and going oh what should I do now and you'd be like meet this sab group you're over in this area and then they would start becoming I really like this I know this area I've worked you know if you could imagine if there was a badger coal here and there was a sat there and I'd travelled from the other side of the country and I was, I'd was i seen shooters come to this gate and then I'd uh, put my torch on and they'd uh, scuttled off. I'd, I'd, I'd have a very strong feeling of wanting to protect this particular sat. Okay. And, and, and that, that did have some logistical problems uh, going on in time. People get emotionally attached to the area and that makes complete sense, but it may make more sense for them to move to another area or something. Yeah, I've got to ask you about your, I mean, you, you, you were in the army. Yeah. Um, and this sort of sounds only, sort so. of lo you know, like a logistical army military operation, but does, was yeah, that no, having I, a... You I know? don't think that it does, no. I think most of my strategies and tactics that I've learned and picked up are campaigning strategies and tactics. And most of those I've learned from campaigning against the section in the late 90s. So they're not... Uh, and then some things I've had to completely learn from scratch are uh, press, uh, never had any experience before with press um, and then social media is completely new. So you call yourself thing. kind of placard waving rather than Che Guevara? Well, um, when I first started doing campaigning against, uh, I, I, I'd, I'd been on a few hunt sabs and I went to uh, Manchester Airport and I was actually digging tunnels with Swampy, I don't know if you remember him. I remember Swampy. Yeah. And then someone said, oh, well, we're going to this vivisection, uh, anti-vivisection demonstration. And I said to them, What's, what, what are you doing? And in my mind, I thought we would be turning up with placards and uh, around a town centre and just saying, well, this is bad, stop doing that. And I was like, are we going to do that? And he said, no, we'll go in, there'll be a few hundred of us, we'll jump over the fence, we'll get the dogs, we'll run off. And I was like, That's, yeah, that sounds brilliant. And uh, That's much more your thing, isn't it? And Don't... I ended up on the roof with a beagle and I went to prison for that. You went to prison for that, OK. Yeah. How long for? I went to prison for five weeks. Right. Uh, and uh, going back to the badger cull, um, what were your, you must have bumped into the police a lot and they must have known that you had this history and therefore you're likely to push, if not break the law. So are we talking... We're talking in Somerset. Somerset, yeah. So we come across the, I come across the police quite frequently and um, I think um, I'm, they've never seemed to, they've never really talked about cages and they've never really put any, as far as I'm aware of, of the six years, I think only one person has been prosecuted and I think they might have lost their job over it mm. because of the nature of their job but I think they pleaded guilty they were kind of banged up I think they just climbed over a wall and they were caught but that's one person we've had we have hundreds of cages across the coal zones are you saying that because of the kind of low policing level it's kind of legal no well I would have thought that I would say that now that you know nearly anyone can get away with anything if they put their mind to it but I think back in 2013 we saw huge sums of money being spent by the police and the police had uh, the thermal imaging, the night vision kit to, to catch us, but they, I don't, they didn't seem to try to catch us, jumping up and down in cages. What, what, did, what did 
prison teach you about the kind of the limits of how far you can go, what you can do? Well, before I went into prison, I was obviously like anyone would be. Well, what's prison like? Is it how scary is it? And uh, people reassured me, although there's still obviously a concern that animal rights people are pretty much left alone. And I spoke to someone who'd been in the 90s who, who, who said that in his 20 years of doing animal rights, he'd only ever come across one person who had had real troubles in prison. And he said, and if you met him, you'd understand he's was, he was a very annoying person and would go out of their we, way. We have annoying people on the shooting side as well. I, can, I, can, I get that. So yeah. they were basically just keep your head down, don't get involved in drugs, um, and but, you'll be fine. But you didn't come out of it going, right, I've got to kind of tone down my activity a little bit. I've got no. to... I mean, so when I came, so when I came back into uh, animal, so I, I stopped doing animal rights in the late 2000, and I started again 2012. In my mind, I was kind of prepared to be given a one-year prison sentence or spend one year in prison. That kind of strikes me as a kind of level of reasonably acceptable. It's probably where you're going to go next, isn't it? If if prison. you get caught doing well, you know, if you if you're caught doing these things, then the next judge will probably go right. Five weeks didn't work last time. Let's try one year. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, I've, I've already had one suspended prison sentence since I've been doing this, and okay. it wasn't for anything, I, you know, it was because I broke an injunction. Okay, right. So yeah. breaking an injunction gave me uh, an eight-month suspended prison sentence, but it was two months for this, two months for this. Two, one of those two months was filming someone who was a coal director, mm. but I filmed him in the process of breaching multiple uh, Badger Coal licence regulations. Right. But, but but, that, but, but, but because he had an injunction, I wasn't allowed to film him. Yes, well, from a legal point of view, you, you, can, you can see the point there. But yeah, yeah, I yeah. can, completely. But, all, that, but that wasn't going to stop me from filming him. No, OK. Um, let's talk a little bit about your, your kind of... Um, your compass in this 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 area because I, I think we, what we see is, you know, there's, there's the laws of the land mm. and then there's the laws of the land as sort of mildly adapted by you. Is that fair to say? I mean, you, you know, you are prepared to do things which are clearly against the law, although you don't have to admit that. I'm, mm. I'm going to put those words into your mouth. And and so, where where are those lines drawn? I mean, would you have you ever got into a fight with somebody over this issue? Actually, a, a human. Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah. So that's uh, one of the things that in the 90s stopped me from uh, going hunt sabotage, doing hunt sabotage. Hunt sabotage. I was unblocking a badger set. So uh, back then, it was lawful to fill in badger sets to stop a fox from going to ground uh, as Can't long as a, yeah. I think a straw or a stick could be pushed through okay. the soil it was legal mm -hmm. um, I came across it I was un unblocking it and uh, someone came up to me and started strangling me and I was face to face with them and they were much smaller than me and in my mind I was going through a process of how I was going to just basically it was going to end up with me punching them in the throat getting them to the floor and doing serious damage to them and I, I, don't, I didn't know I was just stood there like just going just get, just, you know, I was just pushing them off, mm. which wasn't very difficult. But when I walked away from it, I was quite shaken. I was thinking, I got really close to really hurting, like starting to fight them. Mm. And for what? Some horrible little toe rag. And if I, was, if I was actually going to go out and really do damage to another person, surely that person should be the, the, the CEO of some major corporation. But you, why, would, why would I want to go to prison for beating someone up no. who was nobody? Well, it okay. just doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, well, so, so, so what I'm saying is... There's a philosophical point there, but I mean, it, it's a, basically it is, still, it is still possibly in your kind of... In your attacking view of the people world. isn't, for me. Right, not. Okay. No. But if they were the CEO of, you know, Badger Killers United or something yeah. like that, I mean, what... what how and if someone you... else did it... If somebody else did it, yeah. you would represent them? I wouldn't particularly... It would be difficult for me to represent them because we're supposed to be non-violent. So, uh, uh, ALF is, can be, I mean, uh, no. I mean, uh, is it aggravated trespass or criminal? It's the one yeah, where Yeah, that's you, not violence against the person. Not, okay, right. So basically violence against the people are fairly sacrosanct. So if, if I am, mm. if I were a badge of colour and I came across you on a dark night, mm. I'd be thinking, well, at least he's not going to hit me. Yes. Okay. You definitely think that. Good. But if okay. you uh, got out your torch and started swinging at me or got in, in my face and you shouting... you defend yourself. Possibly, yeah. 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 Okay, fair enough. Quite possibly. Right. I might not. I might just, you know, I might have a camera on and think, oh, this is great. You're, I'm going to film you attacking me. Yeah, okay. Um, what about what about criminal damage, though? So it's cage stamping No problem like with it. cage. I've done quite a few cages in my time. Right. So I haven't got any problem with that. And I haven't got any problem with admitting to it. There were, there were issues up on Exmoor. There was a farmer who claimed somebody had emptied his diesel tank into a swimming pool. That isn't good, is it? I don't think uh, emptying diesel into anything is good. No. And I also heard of a farmer who had uh, human faeces put into a swimming pool, which, uh, whilst isn't much fun, isn't doing any real damage to anything. Yeah, I think di putting diesel out. Not so good. Okay. No, it's not, is it? It's, it's poisoning the, an ecosystem, potentially. Yeah, so you say you're, you're against that from 
env on environmental grounds. Yeah. But, but supposing it was, I don't know, supposing you had a tanker full of blackcurrant juice or something, you put that in. If it was the cow slurry, that'd yeah, be it's fine. Like, well, that'd be funny. Okay, it'd be funny. All right, so there, I mean, there are these, these. I mean, that would be quite a sort of, you know, you're in the kind of five figures area of, of solving that problem if you're that farmer. Five figures in pounds, so that's that's quite quite a lot of criminal damage. A, a cage is about what is it? A hundred quid, eighty quid. quid. Okay, yeah. so two figures for yeah. stamping on that. But it might be two figures to stamping on it. But if you do, but from a criminal point of view, if you do multiple ones, or if you were, uh, you could be arrested for conspiring to commit criminal damage. Mm. And if you go over a certain level, it's many, many, many years in prison. So it's not too to be taken too lightly. You do have to uh, safeguard yourself. You do have to take some counter secure you know measures if you were going to go if you uh, you know if i found a stash of 100 cages just there and i was thinking right i'm going to smash all these 100 cages that's ten thousand pounds worth of criminal damage that yep. puts me potentially if i got caught into the into an arena where i go to prison for many years yeah i would not be chatting about it down the pub no i wouldn't be bringing my mobile phone here i no. probably wouldn't be driving past a house that's got cctv no sure yeah. You're, you're and, I, and, and, I, and I certainly you know you're on YouTube, don't you? And I certainly wouldn't be saying uh, afterwards I once smashed 100 cages. I've yeah. said to you, yeah, I jump up and down on cages, okay. singular. Oh. I haven't conspired with many other people to jump. I haven't. And as far as and as far as representing somebody who does these things yeah. is concerned, I mean, as the ALF press officer, yeah. you are happy to go up to, but not including. Uh, somebody hitting somebody. That's example. within the that that is within the remit of the animal liberation. Do you have a sort of ALF charge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. not and hurting people or individuals is part of it. So you couldn't set fire to a barn full of uh, cows to put the cattle farmer out of business. No, but you because can. But you can release a whole lot of pheasants to certain death. Uh, yeah, but you couldn't set fire to them or uh, go and kill them all. They're taking their what chances you, with the. You do well. They're taking their chances uh, with the wild, and the, that is a finer point. But you're not. You aren't doing. Uh, you're not inflicting the violence to the individual. I mean, I think what would be great for the game farms or for the pheasants from the game farms, particularly, is if you could restrict your cutting the fences from the game farms to daylight. They, they have a chance to get into trees. Okay. If you, if you could bear that one in mind, that'd be very helpful. I don't know if they'd have a chance of getting into trees if they were brailed, and uh, again, you know, braille it, the game. But if it's a covered uh, cage, they won't be. Okay. So yeah. the the two. Check it first. So the. No, that, that's right. They're not supposed to be brailed if it's covered. Yeah. I can't remember what the exact they are. That, are. Like, well, okay. they are. You, you know the rules. I am telling you. That, I'm okay. telling you that for right. a fact. With the the pens, the breeding pens, their birds are not supposed to be brailed if they are covered. Yeah. Okay. We, but they are. We we are all committed to stamping out bad practice in it as we see it according to codes of practice because we are happy to be educated about these things. What I'm worried about is that you're also kind of representing a slightly authoritarian view where you are. You would like this to be enshrined in law and the police to come down hard on people. I, I, I want to be taught not to do these things, not no. bossed. Well, the, the DEFRA spent half a million pounds on a report looking at what would be best for... That sounds uh, marvellous. Mm. Half a million. That's and true. barren cages shouldn't be a thing. I mean, if, you're going to spend, if the government are going to spend money on it and you're talking about the law, mm. I let, educate me into it, yeah. well, game farmers have been told. And there is a game code okay, well, and it's all there and they're completely ignoring it. So when you're saying, well, I'd rather be educated into it, well, there's a code. It's yeah. been ignored since 2010. Nine years later, if the Labour Party got in at the end of this year and I'm pushing hard within the political lobbying yeah. to end raised cages or, or to end any element of your shooting industry that, that has huge ramifications, you may be sitting there going, well, that's not fair. I'm being legislated against. Yeah. I want it to be educated. It's like, well, you had quite a few years. Well, I, I mean, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the, sort of the, the sensible version of animal rights is, is, I mean, I wouldn't do naming and shaming uh, unless it's people on your side. But uh, maybe the sensible way to do it is, you, you know, you take the photograph and you hand it to the game farmer next day and say, you know, you're not supposed to do this. It says mm. so in the code of practice. Mm. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. Maybe that would be a kind of completely legal non-violent well, maybe I should, we're maybe walking into game farms and filming and getting his attention and just waiting and calling the police and calling trading standards but that, so and that calling you and saying yeah. well what are we doing what are we doing so that to me that sounds like a kind of better version than going in at night and cutting wire or stamping on cages anyway well that's I know, i'm not gonna that say that's a good tactic okay <laughs> i think that might have been consensus there that's that's amazing all right one one more thing one more thing about compass uh, a lot is made of the fact that or a lot is made in uh, pro hunting pro Roger Culling uh, side about your your change of name. Mm -hmm. So, they your name is down as Gamal or Jamal Ebo. No. no. So I was born Jamal Ebo. You're, is that an Egyptian name? 
No, it's Lebanese. Lebanese name. So I was named after Jamal Abdel Nasser, who died in September 1970. I was born in October 1970. And then... You don't sound terribly Lebanese. No. <laughs> How's your Arabic? So, well, not as good. Uh, and so then uh, around 2010, I decided not to... My parents uh, split up when I was two years old. In 2010, uh, I got to 40 and I was thinking, I've still got my dad's surname and I'm still using it all of the time. And my dad's never done anything for me at all. He's not there for me. He never has been there for me. He's never shaped anything I do. Uh, and I felt that it was the right thing to change my surname. So I changed my surname to Tiernan, which is my grandmother's maiden name. I was going to say, because, you know, if you've got a name like Jamal Hippo, yeah. why change the name to Tiernan? That's yeah. even more complicated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you did that. Yeah. So um, I changed my surname to Tiernan. Yes. So my name now is Jamal Tiernan. On my driving license says Jamal Tiernan. On my passport says Jamal Tiernan. And J comes from simply, my name is spelt with a G, mm -hmm. but it's pronounced with a J. So it's and nice. can you imagine how many times I've said that? <sighs> I mean, I would imagine lots. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> because it's you know, it's also a, it's also a question of why does he change his name? You know, yeah. he's not an actor. But the J thing has been a thing like forever. Okay, so right. So you've always been J, and yeah. you just moved your surname around. Yeah. Okay, Got, thank you for clearing that yeah. up. All right, last thing I want to talk about is, and we've kind of sort of touched on this off camera, but. This direction of travel you're talking about, you've got your red lines about veganism, which you will not cross. You have your sort of slightly altered perception of, of what, what the law should be when it comes to protecting uh, wildlife. What do you want this huge patchwork of English landscape to look like? Uh, well, straight immediately, if we look at the cows over there, they're eating uh, grass, and it may be that they're uh, only eating grass. It may well be that, but the fact remains that nearly 50% of the world's crops, so it's not just England that we talk about, we say what, what do we want the world to look like, because we are importing tons and tons of cattle feed from all over the world, and that feed is frequently things like soya, and now in England we're growing lupin, those are things that we could be eating directly, so instead of... <laughs> it happens to the best of them, apparently. <laughs> So this person had just uh, found a uh, fallen stock and uh, that fallen stock, the runoff from it and slurry from it was going into a stream. Yeah, bad. It went to... Uh, Not terribly bad, I mean, you know, it's a little yeah. bit of gravy and, and quite that, a lot of streams. And that uh, farmer's got TB. Got TB or it tested... Has, or yeah. tested do you mean not negatively tested positively? They or have got the actually TV. actually got yeah, it. They've okay. got TV. Right. Uh, and the environment agency won't deal with it because he isn't prepared to give his uh, name. So it's, although it's nothing really hasn't got anything to do with him, he's just reporting it. Mm. They won't go off, and, and the reason they won't go and report, uh, look at it, even I think even if they did, even if he did give his name, is because they can't afford to. Well, that's that certainly seems to be a, the case in government at the moment. Yeah. They, they they just they haven't got the money to do it. So I think we have this thing where we say, well, what would you like to see? Yes. Um, and I think that uh, it's that we have these knock-on effects, and we I don't I think it's very difficult to know what the knock-on effect of anything is going to be. But I think people now are talking about trying to save the planet by in the last week. Let's try and stop climate change. We can knock 25% of climate change on the head by planting a trillion trees. I can't see that that would be a massive problem. I can't see what the, what the downside of, of planting a trillion trees is. I don't think it would be bad. I don't think anyone, you know, no. there are some things like, I don't know, Chairman Mao killing Sp Stalins or whatever. Sparrows. It, Sparrows, yeah. sorry. The, the Great Leap Forward. Yeah, that was, well, actually, strangely enough, I've just been in China and, and they've gone the other way around now. So they will say, top down, we're planting a trillion trees. Yeah. That's what's happening. Yeah. Get used to it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it happens. And, uh, you know, I... I've been to, I went to the most polluted city on earth on my way to go pheasant shooting in the hills around there and uh, they went and looked at it and said right the reason it's polluted is because it's the coal mining centre of, uh, of China just get rid of all the coal mines and so they've reduced the GDP for that city from 36 billion US a year down to 6 billion so nobody's got a job yeah. but the pollution is beginning to get better yeah. a lot That's how and, and you know, we, we can see a lot of butterflies around here yeah yeah um, there even though it was the most polluted city on earth there were loads of butterflies and uh, wow. again top-down management so in that respect hmm. <laughs> I'm afraid it, it for my side it works yeah but I still say that this itself is the evolution of hundreds of years thousands of years of small land managers who are managing for wildlife 
everything from this. But, you yeah, know, but you're saying that they're, they're only doing that uh, for, for wildlife if there's some financial gain to it. No, I don't no, think no, that's no, always no, the case. No, no, it's not. It's no, not, no. no well, that's what's so nice about this. So obviously the cattle farmer over there would like to make a profit. Yeah. I mean, okay, let's accept that. The pheasant shoot is a luxury. Yeah. You know, probably this pheasant shoot is not going to make anybody rich and it's probably costing the landowner a mm. certain amount, but it comes with an enormous environmental benefit if, if you accept that the pheasant is going to die and is the cornerstone species here. And OK, I know there's a whole lot of stuff about the predators as well, but we've, we've covered that. Mm. But, I mean, over there you've got crops, I think, on that far hill over there, yeah. which um, I think is a uh, good, good waste of good hunting pasture, but there you go. That's, that's, that's their choice. You know, They're yeah. allowed to make that choice if they want to. And then on the far hill you've got woodland, which, again, is... But if they, if that, that seems to me to be a perfectly sensible use of a hilltop. Yeah, and I think that maybe you know, if we if we are all kind of like more woodland is good. Um, so you're, and so, so you're, how are we going to get to more woodland? And yeah. it strikes me that the, the easiest route to getting to more woodland is reducing the amount of cattle. All right, but you're not. But you're not against apart from apart from these red lines about about actual sentient, conscious or you know, empathetic, depending on how far you want mm. to go down that line, beings, you're, you're not against the idea of the solo landowner making up their own mind about their own land, the subjective management decision. I've really, I mean, that isn't the kind of thing where I've really ever thought about. I haven't really thought about how an, an individual, land, you know, I, we could go on, should landowners be able to pass, you know, should land all be state-owned? Where is, where's my, what, why is this one person... Do, do you think that? I don't know. You know, it's like, I, I don't really have any strong thoughts on it, I, because I, I think that I don't have strong thoughts on it, because I don't think that there's any political system in place that I could uh, get behind, which would give me access to my own land. The only way that I could get access to having one of these fields down here is uh, by probably capitalising on other people's work to make enough money to be able to buy that, which is never going to happen for me. So why should I really be talking about how this other person should be behaving? What I would say is I'd like to see anyone behaviours in the common good, and the common good not just being the common good for us uh, per se, but maybe the long-term common good for the entire planet. And I think that veganism, for me, would help go, you know, a long way towards that. The more people who don't consume livestock, the less of... You know, that field over there doesn't need to be cows. That field over here is also used for cows. That means that both of these fields could be woodland. Has this chat been helpful? Has it been helpful for me? Uh, it hasn't been unhelpful. <laughs> and we reached we reached one point, which is you know it would you did say it would be better for you to, to go to a game farmer in the daytime with a camera and overturn some I, would, I can see that as a, as a positive, ta a, a useful tactic to do. I'm not saying that that's the only thing people should do, but I certainly think people should do it. Yeah, well, then why not confront people, you know, as long as you're not uh, screaming and shouting in their face it, if you want to get a positive response from them. But that doesn't mean that that person's going to change. I mean, I think that you'd probably be doing it to highlight the fact that these things go on. And when, you know, we see people going into, say, pig farms, we wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that the people who are going into those pig farms expect the pig farmer to go, yeah, you're right. I think that the people going into pig farms are trying to show the general public, look at these pigs, look at the condition they're in. And when we do that with game farming, it's a completely different thing because most of the general public are not involved in uh, pheasant shooting. No, they're not. But I, 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 mean, I still think you're, you're in the area more of bombing your way to the negotiating table than achieving a kind of consensual change that could work could help well I, you know i think that the th the the pieces of there isn't any legislation um there is this code of practice for rearing game birds and i do see that legislation probably has to happen i'm not really one for wanting to cheer on any particular political side because i've been on the receiving end of uh labor you just squashed the fly yeah, yeah. Just, i've you been just, on the receiving you just, you just killed the fly he just killed the fly <laughs> we'll rewind and see if i actually did kill it or brush it off <laughs> okay you brushed, um, it off. you brushed off i'll let you have that uh, so I'm not in the. I'm not going to say, oh yeah, the Labour Party. They'll they'll be the solution to all our problems because yeah. uh, people got behind the Labour Party in '97, uh, and in 2001, I think there was uh, act brought in specifically to protect the vivisection industry, and that was because Pfizer's went to Gordon Brown and said, you will do something about these animal rights people, or we will leave the country. And Gordon Brown did as he was told. Well, I can't comment about that, but it does sound like perfectly normal political practice yeah. to me. Yeah. All right, well, look, thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie.